we are going to talk uh, about resource management, in, particularly, in particular about RAII, and we are going to see some concept, uh, cons some concept about it. Uh, so let's see why we're talking about this. Uh, C++ is an object-oriented programming language. Uh, let's say the main selling point are performances and full control. Uh, and performance and full control are somehow faces of the same coin. Uh, full control allows us to do whatever we think it is best, but it is also uh, hard to do everything. So, you, has, you have full control, but you have to control everything in order to get the best performances. So, let's take an example. With memory management, uh, it's surely one of the main aspects that we want to have control on. For optimization reasons, mainly in our context in HPC, uh, where we want to reduce memory operations cost. But there are other contexts where you might have some memory limitation, like in embedded programming with small architectures. And with C++, let's say this is why C++ is used in this context, because you have full control and you control every single detail and you get best performance and you get the minimal resource requirement that you need to comply with. But it's not just about resources. We just saw an example with memory, but actually whatever resource you want to use, you want to use it correctly. And it can be a file, a socket, whatever. And full control of a resource means managing it, managing it correctly. The resource generally have an initialization, a protocol for initialization, let's say, but also for cleaning up the resource and releasing it. Another aspect is you have to keep it alive till you need it. Why should we care? I don't know how many of you have ever had a problem with rest conditions. Uh, it's a nightmare. Uh, you, you cannot have an easy way out. And managing wrong, uh, in a wrong way the, a resource may, might end up in the worst way possible. And it's also very difficult because you have to do everything correctly because you have full control. Uh, but objects goes around in your code, in your code space. You, uh, you might copy it. You might assign it to a different thread. And you have to keep up with all the things going on. And doing it manually becomes unsustainable. In, it doesn't scale very well. But full control doesn't mean that it has to be hard to do. Uh, some languages address this problem, in particular the, the memory problem, with garbage, garbage collectors. But it has a, a cost in terms of performances, and con mainly in performances. And so it's not a solution that C++ would allow. And so do we have a way out? Yes, we should leverage the language, which give us some tools that we should rely on to, ha to, to have this control without have the burden of the control. One thing that was mentioned also, I think, in the, the very introduction part from Mauro, was about RAII. Uh, it's a technique uh, that means resource allocation is initialization, and it binds the lifetime of the resource, the management of the resource, with the lifetime of an object. So when we look at the object, we can Im imply that that object is our resource. And this is pretty powerful because in this way, by just looking at the uh, behavior of the object, how the object goes around in our code, 
we can imply what is happening to the resource. And so the resource has to comply with the language, uh, let's say, language rules. Another concept that goes along with RAII is the one of ownership. With RAII, the objects start representing the resource, but in, it implies also that the object has a responsibility of the resource underlying it. And so it has the ownership of the resource. Yeah, there is, a resource can be a memory allocation, can be a file. When you open a file, you are opening this resource, which is the file that you have to open, and you have also to care about closing it. And you can operate on the file if it is open. So you have to keep it open till you need it, okay? It might be a socket for a uh, communication over the network, it can be whatever, okay? It's a very high level thing. We generally, let's say the, the most simple thing is memory. You get an allocation, you can write and read from it until you deallocate it. Is it? Yeah. Okay. So the ownership, uh, the object starts representing the resource and it starts also representing also the ownership of this resource. So whatever it happens to the object, we have to think that it is happening also to resource. We will see how, uh, what this means actually, but. And these two concepts about AII and ownership are uh, an abstraction. We are still thinking about, resor about resources. We still have to do all we had to do before but we are relying on the, on the language to let it do whatever it is correct for the object, okay? But we are already at an higher level than just keeping it alive till we need it. Uh, let, uh, we said that memory is the most simple resource that we can think of because we all deal with the, this resource. Every C and C++ developer has for sure had to deal with pointers. Do you know what are pointers? Is it a more, yes, yes, okay. Uh, so what happens usually, you, you, you might have to allocate some memory and keep, it uh, keep its reference to inside, its address in a pointer. You can use it, and in the end, you usually deallocate it because you, want, you don't want memory leaks. You just want to deallocate because you don't need it anymore. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are the right tool to manage the memory resource? Let's see some problems that we have to deal with. Uh, I took a random API call from, I don't even, I never use this. But this call uh, returns a pointer. It requires a pointer in input, which is this, uh, it's not really visible, but it's a T, and some other parameters, okay? It is called multi-fits F solver alloc. We expect that this function is going to allocate some memory, right? And probably, even without looking at the documentation, this memory allocated is returned in, as a pointer, right? So whatever it returns is the memory allocation. But actually, it also requires a pointer to uh, F-solver type, right? And uh, this F-solver type, who has to keep it uh, alive? Did I allocate it previously? Should I keep it alive till I need it? So there is already a dependency. And that's a problem, it's difficult to manage it. Oops. Another problem. If I allocate with new, 
I have to, delete, to deallocate it with delete. If I locate it with new array, I have to use delete array. And actually, I, I also uh, cited these two parts from the C++ reference. The, the, behavior, the behavior is undefined if we mix, mix, mess up the things, if we use new with delete array or new array with delete. So it is something that we should take care of. And it's not about being lazy. It's we already thinking about what the code should do. So our cognitive load is about what should the code do. And in addition to that, we are also involved in remembering what it has to do in which, right, in which order. And it has to be done in the right order because of dependencies, because of uh, lifetime issues. So it's, it's already enough, but there's more. Even if we, are sup we have superpowers and we are able to control everything because we are super, uh, look at this code. Uh, it's a simple function. It allocates a buffer. It might use it. it, use it. Then there is a conditional, uh, if a equals zero, return false and then use it again, and in the end, because we know that we have to relocate it, we delete the buffer and return. There is a problem. If we return from the conditional, the delete is not going to be called, and that's a memory leak. You can say, yeah, we can add a delete inside there, yeah. What about exceptions? How do you control the code when you have exception? You cannot know which line is going to, to throw an exception, an exception. And so you're not sure that you're going to release the memory that you allocated. Are you, do you, do you feel like, do you feel the problem that we have now? The problem is that row pointers do not follow RAII and do not express ownership. That's the point. What if we could have an object that allows us to avoid these problems by implementing RAII and express ownership? Let's try. We said that we should leverage the language. Let's think ab about this code snippet, which is not a really code snippet, but it's just for reference. We have a scope, and there is less row pointer in it. It's defined as with the name A. What happens there? The constructor is called, right? And when it goes out of scope, whatever it happens, being it exception, a quick return, whatever, the, the destruction of that same object is called, right? So we have two handles from the language the constructor of an object and the destructure of the, of the object. So we can say that we can do something custom when the object is created through the constructor and something that has to be done when the object is destroyed. So the resource is going to be released. Does it ring a bell? I mean, does it make sense to you? We, we have an handle both on the creation time and the destruction time. And let's say the, the real magic happens inside the destructure because it is the one that it is called in different situations. Like we, uh, in the previous example, we had the exception, uh, exception problem. We didn't know when the exception was going to, to be thrown. It might be thrown or not. But in any case, the destruction of the object, of this object, is going to be called. In this code snippet, there is a very simple less row pointer. Uh, we don't do anything special in the constructor. Uh, we just take from a, a pointer from the outside. So someone 
gives us an allocation that has been done with new, for example. And in the structure, if the pointer is valid, we call delete. Okay, it's a very simple one, but let's compare it with previous examples. On the left, we have the, the manual management of the resource. We added the additional delete inside the, the condition, inside the if, and that's correct. On the right, it's easier. We allocate the less row pointer data. We, allocate, we initialize this as a resource, and it is going to be alive till it goes out of scope. Whatever happens, be it, if it is a quick return, no problem, but also if it is an exception. Do you agree on this? So now we implemented AII. The object actually, let's say, follow the resource, represent the resource. But what does it mean, ownership? The object has responsibility over the resource. So whatever the language allows to be done on the object, it should deal with the behavior of the resource. What does this mean? Does this mean? The object, what happens to an object? We can copy an object, right? We can assign A to B. It gets copied, right? But if we copy an object, what should happen to the underlying resource? I don't know. It depends on the resource. We will see later some example. But for sure, we, we are looking for an handle for, also for this phase of the object lifetime, right? If the object gets copied, we want to have control of, of what it is going to happen on the resource. Someone have any clue about what this handle of the language could be when the object gets copied? Sorry? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking more about um, a, a special function inside the object that gets called when we copy an object. We have the copy constructor and the copy assignment operator. When the object gets copied, there is where we can customize the, the behavior of the object. And so we can customize what happens to the underlying resource. Did we define any copy constructor or copy assignment operator in the previous less, re or less row pointer object? No. So the language already provides some default for that. Since it doesn't know anything about the resource and cannot assume anything about the resource, it is going to give us a default basic one that makes sense in, in various cases, but not always like we are going to see. The destructure does nothing. And the copy constructor copy by value all the attributes of the class. What attributes do we have inside the class? I, I copied it here. What are the attributes of the less row pointer class? Just the pointer. And what does it mean copy by value a pointer? just copying its address. So if we copy this class, if we do less row pointer A equal another less row pointer, we are going to copy exactly the same memory address. And what happens? We create a less row pointer like we did before. We allocate a new int and we assign 26 value to this memory allocation of this single int. Then we enter another scope and we create less row pointer B copying from A, okay? Then it goes out immediately out of scope because it doesn't do anything that in nested scope. So B gets released. And is it a valid pointer? We copied it, right? So it's a valid pointer. 
so that the structure of B is going to deallocate, right? So the, the memory that we created before get released. Then we go on and we see another creation of less real pointer C that copies from A. What does it contain? What does A contain? A feels like it's still there, the memory, because it, it stores the, the memory address. Nobody told him that the resource has been deallocated. So yeah, go on, C copies it. Now A and C feels like I have the same memory, okay? And then when they are going to uh, go out of scope, what happens? C is going to be destroyed. It feels like the memory is valid because the pointer has been copied, but the memory has been already deallocated, right? And the same would be for A. It feels like, yeah, I have the pointer. It, it's valid, I mean, it means that it has an address. So, boom, double allocate, the allocation, right? Can you follow me on this? So, there is a guideline from, let's say, C++ community. It's rule of three. And it says that if a class either requires a destructure, a custom destructure, uh, a custom copy constructor or a custom copy assignment operator, it almost for sure need all of them. This means that if we do something special inside of the structure, like we did in the less row pointer example, we are deallocating, okay? It's not an empty structure. We are doing something there. Actually, we also need the copy constructor, but we didn't do it, right? We didn't create, implement any copy constructor at the moment. That's why there was a problem. What to do in the uh, copy, constru uh, copy constructor or copy assignment operator? It depends, like we, did, we said before, it depends on the resource. It may have to be a clone, like a deep copy. We can decide that when we copy an object, owning a memory allocation, we allocate more memory we copy the values, we do a deep, deep copy, so there are two different resources, okay? We can also say, no, you cannot copy this object. It doesn't make sense to, for this specific resource to be copied. We don't want to copy it. There might be other chances, but whatever you want to do it for the resource, whatever you want to have as behavior, you have to say it. Let's extend a bit these two examples. Uh, in these two examples, examples the less row pointer, uh, the, the, the default con uh, constructor and the uh, custom constructor are equal, okay? Then we added, we have the same destructure, okay? But it is different the behavior that we implement for the copy constructor and the copy assignment operator. Can you say what, what does the, the one on the left? Well, it is written in the title, but can you, can you understand how it works? The copy constructor allocates a new int, okay, and copies the value from the object that it is being said to be copied from, right? And the uh, assignment operator does exactly the same thing using the copy constructor just implemented. It's an idiom copy, uh, called copy and swap, but it's doing, it's reusing the copy constructor. So that one is a deep copy. We are duplicating the resource, okay, because we can. It makes, it might make sense for the memory. But if not, we can say no, we want to delete the copy constructor and the uh, copy assignment operator. We don't want to make it happen. When we are going to write less row pointer A equal B, it won't compile. It doesn't make sense to copy it. Okay, so we started from row pointers and we started implementing this new object, this less row pointer. Uh, 
let's go through the problems that we saw for the row pointers and let's see if we made something better. Who is responsible? The object itself. If we look at the object, we know that it is up to the object to allocate and allocate. Well, actually, we are, we are, as developers, we instruct the object to allocate and, but we know exactly when it is going to be deallocated, right? How should it be re released? We didn't see it because we didn't see yet the templates, but we can specialize this object to work both for simple, uh, simple allocation, the new, but also for arrays. We can make it work differently, slightly differently for new array, okay? Because we want to customize also the allocation, right? The burden of the management, no worries, it is up to the object, because if it goes out of scope, it will take care of clean up the resource. All execution paths, yes, because it is embedded into the language how the object works. In case of exception, again, yes, it's going to work. Is it, is it clear for everyone why this might make sense? Okay, so what do we have till now? An object representing an ownership of a memory allocation. This last implementation is not copyable, so we cannot make a, a copy of this object. So the ownership of the resource is exclusive and cannot be transferred in any way. When we allocate, it's there. It can be just deallocated. About ownership, we, ident we can identify mainly two types, unique ownership and shared ownership. It might, I mean, it, it's pretty straightforward even for the names, but unique ownership is exclusive. Shared ownership, the same exact resource is used from different objects. Okay, but it is exactly the same. It's not a deep copy. They using they referring exactly to the same resource, and they and they are managing it together. Okay. Can you can you tell what type of ownership less row pointer implements between unique or shared? Yeah, go on. Unique because it cannot be copied, so it's a unique ownership. Right? So, we did just part of the work. Uh, less row pointer uh, has some functionality, implements RAII, it represents ownership, but there is more to do. We have to generalize for different types. At the moment, we just al allow a single int. Uh, it is strictly for memory, and that's not general. I mean, we can just use this uh, object for memory and not for a file, not for a socket. Uh, we said that we can just allocate one int and not an array, so we have to work also on that side. We allocate and release the resource cleanly, but we don't have access to the resource. <laughs> We, we just closed inside the object a pointer, but we didn't give any chance to access the internal things. And we might have to decide something more about ownership. At the moment, we decided to go easy with unique ownership, but who knows? It looks useful. It's, it looks strange that nobody thought about that. Actually, we should check and we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. I mean, it's a basic thing and it should be there somewhere. We should look on GitHub, look for the repositories, we should find something. It's easier because STL implements it and it's already there. Uh, actually, there are different solutions uh, with a lot of uh, functionalities. There are unique pointers and shared pointers, even here, straightforward. Do you think that unique pointers does anything special about ownership? It's unique ownership. And shared pointer, it's a shared ownership. 
There is also weak pointer, which I never used. I don't know almost anything. I just know why it is, it might be useful, but I didn't, probably Michael, you know, better what kind of use case there might exist. Yeah, go on first. Uh, wait. Something that uh, uh, might, for example, cache something, and uh, uh, a cache should use the pointer if it's there, but should not block it from get deleted. So in a cache, you would use a weak pointer, and just before using it, you you check if it's actually there, you get a strong uh, share pointer back and, and then you use it or if it's, uh, uh, already been deleted, uh, then you get null and it's okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we are not, let's say it's a advanced usage, I would say, or a particular use case. Generally, it is enough. Or it's a good starting point to know that unique pointers and share pointers are there to be used. And they are defined in the memory header, so it is enough including memory, and we have access to these two. I added this slide, I don't know if it is readable, but it's just uh, a couple of screenshots from CPP reference. I don't know if you, okay, that Fauzi already mentioned. Uh, we can see that well, constructor and the structure are not listed there, but you can see them. Uh, there is release, there is reset, there is swap. There are a lot of functionalities already implemented, and they implement unique ownership and shared ownership. Uh, and they give access to the underlying memory through the get, uh, the get function member. There's nothing special about unique pointers. About shared pointer, it's interesting to know that w we can construct, uh, construct a shared pointer by copying another shared pointer. And what happens here is that the ownership is shared, okay? Indeed, unique pointer is not copyable, like the one that we started implementing with less row pointer. Unique pointer is not copyable. Share pointer is copyable, okay? And by copying, we are sharing the resource over different objects. It's not so easy. There is a machinery behind. Share pointers are implemented with a reference count. They are also called reference counted smart pointers. Uh, the name already tells what it does. It keeps a counter of how many references in, in the, let's say, in the objects there are using that resource. Okay. And this, and it is in their, in the, in this control block. This control block is what is used for orchestrate between different objects saying, I'm using it. I'm using it. Okay. When some object gets destroyed, it, removes itself, it decrements the counter in the control block, okay? And that's it, there is this control object. When the counter gets to zero, it's the last object that uh, is saying, okay, I'm not using anymore. Ah, zero users, I, I was the last one. I should also take care of releasing it, okay? It's a nice uh, uh, machinery. And it works nicely. It has some cost. Control block and the resource itself are two separate allocations, generally. Okay, they, they are two different part of the object, let's say. There is the control block and the resource. If they are allocated with two allocations, it has the cost of two allocation. And generally, it is suggested to use make shared, which is a, let's say, an helper function from the STL that allows you to at least allocate them 
close enough so that the memory access, the subsequent memory access are more local. There is another cost. Shared pointer is thread safe. The control block can be accessed from different threads, but this has a cost. The threads has to be synchronized because otherwise we might read an a counter, the, the classic problem with threads, right? So there is a synchronization, and the synchronization on the code, uh, on the control block as a performance cost. Uh, a note, it's the control block that is thread safe, not the resource itself, okay? So it's row against smart pointers, no. We have to use both of them. They have their usage. Actually, row pointers are really useful. They don't cost almost anything in terms of resources, okay? The main point to keep in mind is about ownership. We said that row pointers do not express ownership. When we don't want to express this concept, like saying, okay, this part of the code is getting some kind of ownership over the resource, if it is not doing something like that, we don't need unique or smart or shared pointers. We don't need smart pointers at all. It is enough a row pointer. Otherwise, if we, let's say, if we get a shared, po a shared pointer, even if we don't have to express ownership, it's not a problem, it's a performance problem, because each time we copy a shared pointer, we are synchronizing over the control block, we are increasing the counter, and when it gets released, we are going there, synchronizing over a control block, decrementing the counter, nothing to do, okay, I can continue on. But if I know that that part of code doesn't have to deal with ownership, just use a row pointer. This is just, let's say, a screenshot from CPP core guidelines. Uh, we go through them really quickly. Manage resource automatically using resource handles and RAII, we said that. Row pointer is no knowing. Uh, avoid malloc and free, just, just because they are old. Avoid calling also new and delete explicitly. Okay, there are some in the STL, there are helpers that allows us to allocate things without actually calling new. Underneath they are going to call it, but we don't have the direct control of it. Use unique pointer or shared pointer to represent ownership. Like we said, we don't want to use everywhere smart pointers. We have to use both row pointers and shared pointers. Whatever we want to vehiculate, uh, whatever kind of information we want to vehiculate through the API, we have to say that. Preferred unique pointer over shared pointer, unless you actually need the share ownership. Use make shared, use make unique. Uh, and take smart pointers as parameter only to explicitly express lifetime semantics. It's, again, about ownership. If you want to have a look, uh, these uh, CPP core guidelines um, are, available, are available online, and they are descriptive even with some examples in some case, and they're quite useful. So it's from the beginning that we uh, are talking about C++ performance, and it's always the same thing. When you talk about C++, everyone is, cares about performance. And let's see an example of where these performances are, let's say, involved, where we can have control of these performances. This is a very simple uh, dummy data set. Uh, it's, just, it's just a verbose data set. It doesn't do anything, just prints messages that are representative of the operation that it is going to be done. The constructor says, I created a data set. The destructor deleting a data set. Then there is the, what is the name of the third function there? Louder? Uh, that's not the assignment. The copy constructor. The third one. The fourth one is the copy assignment operator. 
And then there is a, an initialized function just for the sake of existing. Uh, so in this case, this object can be copied. And for the semantic that we want to assign to, to this object, it means a deep copy. It doesn't do actually anything. But the idea is copying gigabytes of data. Okay, It's replicating a data set, creating a copy of the same data set. Okay? Clear to everyone what we are dealing with? OK, first snippet, data set A, data set B, and then I assign A to B. OK, so there is a default construction for A, default construction for B, and the copy, OK, a deep copy. What's the output? Create data set, create data set for the B. Copying gigabytes of data, which is the, 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 copy assign, the copy assignment operator called. And then it goes out of scope. Both goes out of scope. And they get destroyed. Are we, do we all agree that it's what was expected? There is something unexpected in the output for someone? OK. Now the, we have a function create data set that returns a data set. In it, we create a data set. So there is a default construction there. We initialize the data set just because we can. And we return it. OK. And how we use this function? We create a data set B. And we use this function to assign the data set, the, to create the data set. The output says create a data set, initialize the data set, Deleting the data set. Do you have an explanation for this? Because I would have expected inside the function, the full, uh, the full constructor, so create a data set, initialize the data set. Then outside, I would have a copy constructor, right? So copy gigabytes of data. And then deleting two data set, the one inside the function and the one outside the function, right? But actually, it is not happening. Because C++ is clever, and it does what it is called copy elision. Copy elision omits the copy constructor, resulting in zero copy passed by value semantics. What does it mean? That even if we, what, what kind of things do, do we expect to be called there with the, with the data set B equals create data set? A copy constructor or a copy assignment constructor, a uh, copy assignment operator? Well, we expect copy assignment. Are you sure? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Who is for the copy assignment operator? Me. Just you? Yeah, just Anyone else? Even you? OK. The others expect the copy constructor be just because I wrote it, or because they have an idea why? Even if there is the equal sign, the copy assignment operator means that there is, there's already a, an object on which the assignment operator works on. But in that line, we didn't, don't have the B object, right? Even if there is the equal, B doesn't exist. It is got, it's getting created there. So it's the copy assignment operator that gets called in that case. Copy, copy constructor. <laughs> the copy constructor gets called. <laughs> and copy elision, what does it say? If there is a copy constructor, the, the compiler can omit this copy call. And it is actually what happened before. We didn't see the call to the copy constructor because it didn't happen. It created the, the object already in place. Instead of creating the, the one in the function and then copying it, it says, OK, it's a copy constructor. I can omit all the creation of the temporary thing and then copy it. I can just use it. I can use the temporary one. Is it clear for everyone? 
It's a no or it's a yes, this silence. <laughs> Okay, same function as before, but in this case, we have data set B, and instead of having equal create data set, we have the data set B, and then on another expression, we have B equal create data set. They are two different uh, expressions. So data set B at the end creates a default data set, on the second line, what do you think it is called? The copy constructor or the copy assignment operator? Assignment, assignment operator, right. And the copy elision rule, what does it say about copy assignment operator? It says about copy constructor, but it doesn't say anything about cop uh, copy assignment. So it doesn't kick in. And what the output says, create data set for the uh, data set B. Then it created data, data set inside the function for data set X. Initialize this data set X. Copy gigabyte of data from the return value X to B for the copy assignment operator. And then deletes both of them, both X and B. There's a waste of resources, right? We, we care about performances, but here we are copying something from X, which is going to be destroyed as soon as it is get copied to B. Why? Why shouldn't just copy, like copulation was doing? It's not C++ that it is stupid. Uh, you have full control. There are handles also for these specific uh, situations. I copied just the relevant part of the previous two examples, where the one with copy elision, so with the copy constructor, and the one without copy elision, so the, using the copy assignment. We were talking about X, the one return, the data set return from the function as a temporary thing, right? We, we, we never use it outside of copying it for B, right? So there is a difference. It, it is temporary what it is returned from the function. And C++ gives an handle also, an handle also for this to know if what we are dealing with inside in the copy phase it is a temporary or not. Before seeing how we can have control of this, we have to realize what's, what, what does it mean temporary, okay? In the beginning, I think pre C++11, no, C++11 had just uh, L value and their values for the move semantic or before, before. Before it has just left and right, left values and right values. Uh, these two definitions are not perfect, uh, but they give a, a, a good idea. There are some corner cases, one I will show one later. But the idea is that a left value is something that we can have on the left side of an assignment operator, okay? It's something that we can assign to. An R value is something that we should usually have on the right side, okay? A better definition is L value is still an approximation, but an L value is something that has an identity. An R value is something that doesn't have an identity. Do you remember in our previous example, uh, the difference between left and right we are assigning A to B. Does A have an identity? What's the identity? The name of it? A. We are copying from A. It has an identity. It's something that we can refer to. Inside here, without seeing the internals of the function, create data set doesn't have an identity. We cannot say it's X. We don't know what happened inside. 
it's uh, temporary. It doesn't have a name. Okay, this is the distinction between the two cases. And actually, for the L value and R value, what do you think? Uh, in the A in the previous example, the left one, is an L value or an R value in the assignment? The A. It's the A is an L value or an R value? Does it have an identity or not? It has an identity, right? It is on the right side of the assignment, but it, it, it can stand also on the left, right? Create data set. Is an L value an R value? Does it have an identity or doesn't have an identity? It doesn't have, so it's an R value, okay? And it is on the right side. Do, do you think it can stand on the, uh, on the left hand, on the left hand? Usually, it doesn't really make sense to assign something to. We will see later there is a corner case. It's not, as I said, the definition are not perfect, but the general idea is that usually you don't expect to invert that assignment, right? Okay, and for these two, L values and their values, uh, there are two kind of references. The single ampersand is, is called like this, and the double one. L values are bound to single uh, L value reference, single ampersand, and R values are bound to R value reference, which is the double one, okay? So, back to the example, we said L value, it's the A, yes, because we know it has an identity. R value, it's the right one, the create data set part. And uh, we know that what we want to have, we, we said that when we have the R value, the right one, we don't want to create a temporary copy from it and destroying it, right? We want to steal things from the temporary. And actually, we use the word still, but in the C++ standard, the, the word is to move. Actually, we want to move things from the temporary, okay? We want to empty the temporary and move the things that he has inside his ownership. We want to move it to the new one, to the B, during the assignment. So this is what we want to do when we have an R value. But we when we have an L value, we don't want to steal things from something that has an identity because the other ones that comes later refers to A and they expect that A has something in it because we, we cannot empty it, right? Is it clear to everyone this situation? What we want to do into, into the two different situations? So let's see how what handle we have in these two cases. We said that L value bind to the single uh, ampersand, and uh, so the L value references, and the R values binds to R value references that are the, top, the double ampersand, uh, ampersand. If we look at the copy constructors and the copy assignment operator, the, the parameter that, you, that we pass to the copy constructor and the copy assignment operator, is it a, an L value reference or an R, R value reference? How many ampersand do you see in there? Just one. Everyone agrees? So it's an L value or an R, or an R value reference in that case? an L value. And so it's the case where we copy from something that has, has an identity, the, the case B equal A. If we instead use an R value reference, so we define something like a copy constructor, but instead of having an L value reference as parameter, we specify an R value reference, like here, this one and this one. That means that in that situation, expect that the parameter that we pass to the assignment or the copy constructor, uh, sorry, the constructor, uh, is an R value. 
So it's a decays on the right. So actually, we are introducing the move constructor and the move assignment operator. They are, let's say, the brothers of copy constructor and copy assignment operator. They, they look pretty the same. As you can see, there is small differences. The main differences are that in copy constructor and copy assignment, we have the L value reference. And in the move, we have the R value reference. But that's nice because we have, at this point, we have two different handles that we can implement differently depending on the situation. We know that in this case, we can steal things from the, the thing that we got past, right? And we can do something different. Instead of copying, we can steal things. Is it clear? OK, so let's extend a bit the the object that we have. It's just the same object as before, but we added the move constructor and the move assignment operator. Can you see it? It's uh, these two one, these twos, OK? Where we say we stole the data set, OK? By just implementing the move constructor, since it is a NER value reference, the create data set, when we do B equal create data set, it's a NER value reference. Instead of calling the copy constructor, it calls the move constructor. Okay? So we actually create a data set, the, the, the B one. We create another data set, the, the X inside the function. We initialize it. We don't have any more the copy. There is stole data set because the move constructor gets called. And instead of copying data, it prints stole data. And then the two data set are destroyed. Do you see the improvement over, let's say, from the performance point of view? We are not copying anymore. We are stealing things from the temporary, right? We said almost one hour ago, we talked about the rule of three. Do you remember the rule of three? If we customize one of the structure, or what was the other two? Copy constructor, a computer assignment operator. If you define one of them, you have to define all of them. With the introduction of the move, which is are very similar to copy constructor and copy assignment, we extend this rule to from rule of three to rule of five. If we don't follow this and we just follow the rule of three, we are miss it's an optimization opportunity uh, missing op op missing optimization opportunity. Okay? Because as we saw at the beginning after the break, we were copying data from a temporary which is was not necessary, right? But by implementing the move semantic, we are improving also the performances because we can control that specific case. This is just a part of the story because we said that there was just L value and R value. But if we know that something with an identity is going to be unused, because we don't need it anymore. We might want to say, OK, you can also steal from this, which has an identity. OK? And actually, the, the, the standard library gives this, uh, this function, which is called standard move, to which you pass an L value. And it makes it like if it is an R value. OK? So actually, there, the move constructor gets called. Even if we are moving, even if we are doing B equal A, we are moving from A. We are saying, let's consider it, it is a temporary, OK? And so A, after this call, it's emptied, probably. We cannot say exactly what's inside A, because it depends on the implementation of move. But there is just an assumption. It's in a specified state. Uh, sorry, it's a valid state, but unspecified. 
Okay, so it can be destroyed, but we don't know what's inside there. Can you see the, how, how useful can be this? Because if we don't need any more A, I want to steal data from there. I don't want to copy and then delete it. Okay, I can, I can gain the performances by not copying. I can just reuse it in another context or with another name. It is called standard move, but Mikael knows because I opened the PR with exactly this title or even more verbose like standard move doesn't move, standard move doesn't move because we had a performance problem because of this. We were thinking that standard move was moving resources, but actually it wasn't because standard move makes an L value appear like an R value, but it depends on the move constructor to actually stall things, okay? We open to the possibility that we can steal from, but it's just a, an unconditional cast. It says, make it like it is an R value. Actually, this is a, a very simple implementation of the uh, standard move. You can see it, this is the, you, if you go at this uh, link, you, uh, the, the, you will have the access to the slide. This link, you will see the actual implementation in LLVM, and it's more or less that one, not, not so, it's not so different from that one. So it's a static cast to a reference reference, an air value reference. Can I have a comment yeah. in this one? Because if you go to look at the code, it is like, this is a function call. So you say, you are calling a function and the compiler has to put the argument on the stack and do something, then pop it, pop it out from, from the stack, but it doesn't happen. When you compile this, this is inlined, meaning that compiler say, you know what, this guy is not doing anything. So it's actually this function is just there to indicate what you want to do, but the code, there's no code that is generated in some sense. And this is what I was, uh, Talking about the, this morning, right? It's really is the the fact that you can align a lot of stuff that at the end makes the code uh, really efficient, right? Because nothing really happens. Yeah, what what Mauro is pointing out is that we are talking with the compiler, but this actually doesn't translate to any assembly operation. It's just telling to the compiler, feel free to consider it a temporary, okay? And this function is just for talking with the compiler. So what we saw before, L values and R values are called value categories, okay? And probably we need more than two because we have this strange thing that we can make an L value be considered like an R value. So we started like this, as identity doesn't have an identity, just a, a disclaimer, this is not a, my, my idea about showing like these value categories, I stole it. But anyway, uh, as an identity, <laughs> I moved it. Uh, as an identity, no identity, so L value, R value. Actually, we introduce another axis, it's movable, like standard move or not. And we can see if it has an identity and it is not movable, it's L value. If it is movable, R value, and it has no identity, but we saw that with standard move, we can have something that has identity, but it is movable. Okay, we take an L value, we put it inside standard move, and it is, it doesn't have an, it had an identity, okay, so it is in that column, and now it is movable. We can move from, we, we can stall things there. Okay. In this transition, I also change from R value to PR value. These are actually names that are uh, used in the C++ standard. And they, when they move from L value, R value to this more, let's say, articulated thing, they change this to pure R value. Okay. And 
now they refer to R values like everything that it is movable. Okay? Something that we have, we, we obtained with standard move, or something that already was an R value, the previous one that we used to know. There is also a name just for completeness for the other uh, direction, and it is gener generic L values, because whatever has an identity, it is a generic L value. Okay, just a quick comment about why the definition were not exactly perfect. Uh, we have a string. We have this function char number that given a string and uh, uh, a size, uh, actually it is an index, it returns a reference to the position in the string. It's a reference. So we are actually referring to that string in that particular position. And we are actually assigning a character to this thing. This thing looks like an L value and R value. The char number string one. Has an identity or doesn't have an identity? It doesn't have an identity, right? But actually, we are assigning it, something to it. It should stay on the right. There's a, uh, let's say, a corner case. When a function return type is an L value reference, is it an L, an L value reference, the return type? Yeah, it's a single ampersand. In that case, the function call expression becomes an L value expression. Okay? And actually, it prints task because we changed the thing. OK, we are almost at the end. Uh, we saw rule of three, rule of five. What do you think it is the next one? A, B, or C? Vote. Who is for A? So rule of seven. One. <laughs> Who is for rule of B? Uh, rule B, a rule of zero? You know something. <laughs> Who is for C? I appreciate that you. <laughs> okay, it's rule of zero. And it says that classes that have custom the structure, uh, custom copy move constructor, or a copy move assignment operator should deal ex exclusively with ownership. So they should care just about managing the ownership. Other classes should uh, uh, not have custom the structure, should not have anything special. Okay, they should live with the default ones. And I will show you quickly an example. There's a typo. Well. Uh, it doesn't really care about what this code is going to do. It's, uh, it's creating a, a context, creating a, a socket in this context, and actually the socket exists and it is valid until the context is there. So we should care about who is going to be released first. Who is going to be released, who should be released first? The socket or the context? Wow. The socket exists just, and it is valid just if the context is alive. So we should care about releasing the socket before releasing the context. Does it make sense? Okay, then we use them, and so actually we release them in the right order, okay? It's a very C-style library, uh, but we can actually improve this with C++. We can, we know rule of five, right? We can implement everything. We can say, okay, by, um, we can uh, get, we, we can create an object that gets the handle, which is this void star. And when the object goes out of scope, we want to call uh, the context destroy function, okay? 
And actually, I just used, because I didn't want to write a snippet like 100 lines, we deleted the copy constructor and we defaulted the move, the move constructor, okay? And this is the code just for the Z ZMQ context, but there should be an, a similar one for the socket, right? Because they have to be managed more or less the same. So we create another snippet with ZMQ socket and then we can use it. Assign ZMQ context to this object, the socket, to this new object, we can use it using, well, I didn't implement get, but yeah, the idea was to implement it. And in the end, we don't have to release it because who knows why we don't have to release it manually? Who is going to take care of the release of socket and context in the right order at the right time? The destruction of the two objects. But, we can apply a rule of zero. Standard unique pointer is a utility from standard library that allows us to express ownership, okay, in a generic way. It doesn't deal just with ints like we did with less row pointer, okay? We can have anything inside it. And so we can have a class that has a, an attribute unique pointer that stores a void. And uh, this second parameter, this second template parameter is what has to be called when the unique pointer is destroyed because otherwise it would use the default delete, which is delete. And so what we do is just, okay, on creation, on the, in the constructor, we create the unique pointer passing the handle that we got from the context creation we pass the function that we actually want to call. Same thing for socket, and the, co and the code is exactly the same, okay? This is partially correct because I implemented a custom constructor there, but the idea is that using unique pointer, we rely completely on the unique pointer to manage all the move, copy uh, and destruction operations at the right time. We didn't write almost anything. It's just about instructing, instructing the unique pointer to do so. So just uh, saying that we saw rule of zero, rule of three, and rule of five. Actually, we should just think about rule of zero and rule of five. Because since when move semantic have been introduced, it doesn't make sense to talk anymore about the rule of three, okay? And actually there is also a guideline in the C++ core guidelines, like we, the one that we saw before for smart pointers, that says prefer applying rule of zero if possible. Otherwise, fall back to rule of five. And actually it is what we did in the last slide. We relied on unique pointer Instead of writing ourselves all the, pro, the, the move and copy, we just rely on a unique pointer. So we saw RAII and ownership. We introduced the rule of three. We saw the smart pointers available in the standard library. We saw the move semantic. Why is it useful? Mainly for performances. We can have full control of all the uh, performances. We extended rule of three to become rule of five. We talked about uh, value categories where we saw that there are different ways to see L values and, and R values. Something that has an identity, not have an identity, that is movable or not. And in the end, we saw rule of zero, which is the alternative rule that we should prefer. And that's it. <laughs>